都不会讲的，接不会讲。
you can flip the first two rights. Uh, as long as that value doesn't get read in between there, you can flip the first two rights and run them in whatever order you like. Now, this idea of equivalence gives us a notion of uh, serializability. So we can uh, talk about a serial schedule where we have all each transaction executing one after the other. And we can say that a schedule is conflict or view serializable if it is conflict or view equivalent to, to one of these serial schedules. Uh, any questions on that? All right. Um, the other thing we talked about was preventing deadlocks. So uh, in order to uh, ensure this sort of serializability, we can uh, use locks. We can uh, guard certain objects against modification uh, by locking them. Uh, but this leads to a situation where uh, one transaction can depend on another transaction to release a lock. And the second transaction depends on the first. Uh, and in that case, neither transaction can proceed. Uh, so you essentially want to have some way of killing one of these transactions and restarting it from scratch. Uh, so the two approaches to that are either to keep track of which transactions are waiting for uh, which other transactions, using what we call wait for graph, and periodically check that graph to see if there is uh, one of these cyclical dependencies in it. And if that's the case, we kill one of the transactions involved in the cycle and uh, proceed on. The other way is to just outright prevent any uh, cycles from forming in the first place, so we can prioritize transactions and uh, if a transaction tries to acquire a lock that could potentially lead to a cycle, uh, that is to say if it acquires a, a lock uh, that is held by a lower priority transaction, um, then we kill one of the transactions. So the two basic strategies for that, um, if, a low, if, a higher pri sorry, if a lower priority transaction tries to acquire a lock held by a higher priority transaction, uh, well, that basically kills the lower priority transaction. And the other way to do it is if a higher priority transaction tries to acquire a lock um, that is held by a lower priority transaction, the lower priority transaction. Okay. Any questions on deadlock prevention? All right. So today's topic, um, I've been using this very, very fuzzy notion of objects when talking about lock. Um, I've said, I've repeatedly said, uh, we want to lock an object. So what exactly is uh, one of these objects? What, what uh, would you think is, is an object that we could potentially want to lock? Thoughts? Hmm? Okay, so we could lock individual couples. Any other thoughts? A table. A table, yes. We can lock take entire tables. Uh, which in a sense, should be technically equivalent to locking all of the tuples in that table. Anything else? Relations. Uh, those are table and relation are, are synonyms. Hierarchical 
structure to these, um, these values. A database contains a set of tables, a table contains a set of pages, and a page contains a set of tuples. Uh, so we don't actually need to decide which to lock uh, because well, there's this hierarchical structure. Um, but that said, we do need some way of um, effectively uh, locking from top down. And uh, so are there any questions on this so far? That is the subject of today's lecture. So we will we will get. To, uh, I, um, I will answer that question, but not uh, over the course of several slides. So the the question then is uh, whether or not a transaction. So what would happen? Uh, let's say if a transaction uh, wanted to modify an individual tuple, what should it do? It should lock that individual tuple. Now, what if the same, at the same time, um, a, another transaction came along and wanted to do a read on the entire table, wanted to just scan the entire table? What should it do? It should lock the table. Uh, OK, so now you have one object, the table, and you have one object, the, uh, the tuple. And is there, in, in a normal locking system, if, if you didn't have anything else, if you didn't know anything else, uh, is there any reason that locking the tuple uh, should also lock the table? Um, so we have one transaction that holds a lock on an individual tuple. We have another transaction that holds a lock on the entire table. But now this, these are essentially two completely separate locks. Is there any reason to think that, uh, I mean, uh, basically unless we, tr unless we try and do something uh, Unless we do something to explicitly connect these two locks together, just locking an individual tuple uh, is not. Essentially, we don't we don't want the. If the transaction uh, that's modifying an individual tuple has a lock on that individual tuple, we don't want any other transaction to be able to come along and lock an entire table. Does that make sense? So. Um, how do we go about this? Well, we're going to need some tools in order to do this. We're going to take our locks. Uh, so far, we've been talking about locks in, uh, as having three modes. Unlocked, locked in shared mode, and locked in exclusive mode. We're going to add two more. We're going to add uh, two types of locks uh, called intent to lock and uh, shared and intent to lock exclusive. And the basic idea of these is, well, actually, let me back up a little bit. So we have our table, and we have our and we have our individual tuple, um, and now we have transaction one that only wants to lock on the individual tuple. We have transaction two that wants to lock on the table. Third lock and uh, transaction one wants a uh, exclusive lock on the top. So what's just abstractly, what is what is one possible way that we could um, prevent transaction one and transaction two from conflicting? Implement hierarchies. Implement hierarchies. Okay, so uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, when we implement say in in uh, Lock, it will allow Forget about the intent locks for the moment. Um, to what is to modify the contents that comes lower in the hierarchy while the other transaction uh, has a lock implemented in the high, higher level of. Okay, so before so transaction one is first going to lock the table. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, so transaction one grabs an exclusive lock on the table. And that's completely correct. Uh, transaction two no longer has the ability to uh, grab that shared lock. On the other hand, what happens if, uh, let's say we have two tuples, and we have uh, transaction two coming along and saying, I want to modify tuple two. These two tuple, uh, tuples are different. 
Is there any reason that we shouldn't allow these two operations to happen at the same time? No. no. Um, so if we use our previous protocol, uh, T2 is going to come along and try and grab the lock on the table first. Does anyone see a problem here? Right. It won't be allowed to grab the lock on the table because T1 has it. Um, so essentially having this hierarchical lock, um, at just using the shared and exclusive modes, uh, those modes are insufficient for our purposes. So we're going to add two extra modes that essentially allow us to do a little bit of uh, extra, extra work here. Um, two, two additional modes that allow us to sort of grab a lock on the table, prevent anything else from locking it, um, but that allow us to, at the same time, uh, have two different locks um, at a lower level. That sounds a little confusing, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, but just to sort of give you the, the big picture here, um, So this, this grid basically shows if you have, so if, if there exists a transaction, um, any transaction that has a lock on a particular um, object that is uh, intent to share, intent to exclusive, intent uh, just regular share, just regular exclusive, then an attempt to grab uh, the corresponding lock is going to either succeed or fail. So for example, if uh, if, there is, if there is a transaction that currently holds an intent to share lock on, let's say, a table, then another transaction come, can come along and grab an intent to share lock. Um, it can grab an intent to um, exclusive lock. It can grab a shared lock on that, but it can't grab uh, an exclusive lock on that. Now, how does this, uh, how does this help us? <coughs> So we're going to grab locks top down in this, this sort of hierarchical way. But rather than grabbing locks, we're going to place restrictions on how the locks can be grabbed. So in order to grab an exclusive lock on an individual tuple, you're first going to have to grab uh, at least an exclusive lock, uh, sorry, an in, at least an intent to exclusive uh, lock on that table. And similarly, if we want Transaction one is going to first have to grab an intent to exclusive lock on the table. On the table. We go back to our big chart here. Big chart here. Um, an intent to exclusive lock is compatible with an intent to exclusive lock. So that. So this is a perfectly legitimate situation. That tuple can be modified. That tuple can be modified. On the other hand, we go back to our earlier scenario where we have transaction two trying to grab a shared lock on that. So transaction one holds an intent to exclusive, and transaction two wants to grab a shared lock. It's going to fail. So that particular combination is impossible, which is essentially what we want. So loosely speaking, in order to grab a shared lock on an object, a transaction must have um, either an intent to share um, or an intent to exclude um, exclusive lock, um, the object's parent. And in order to acquire an exclusive lock, uh, the, the transaction must have previously acquired uh, an intent to acquire an exclusive lock on its parent. Now, there's a question that I want you guys to keep in the back of your minds for a little bit. We'll uh, come back to it in a couple of slides. But why are we limiting ourselves to these intent modes? Um, why is it? Why shouldn't the transaction be able to grab an exclusive lock if it holds an exclusive lock on the parent? So think, keep that in the back of your mind for a little bit. Um, and let's run through a couple of examples. So transaction one holds, uh, a, um, holds a shared lock on a table. 
And transaction two uh, wants to wants to grab an exclusive lock on an individual row of the table. What's going to happen?
lock is compatible with intents to exclude. So typically grabbing that lock on the database is not going to be too expensive. Or it's not going to, yes? Uh, so the internal lock, uh, locks mean they have to go to their closest parent? Uh, I mean, a simple way of implementing this in a database would be to have each object aware of what its parent is. And when you try and lock that individual object, um, the, the locking cascades. So the, if you try and lock an object, the lock manager or um, whichever part of the system was actually implementing that lock would then automatically first try and acquire an intent to exclude lock on that object, that object's parent. Um, so for example, uh, we say uh, T1 holds a, holds a table, mm -hmm. and T2 holds a, another table which is related to the, the table held by T1. So will, will the lock go up to the like, database? Well, it depends on uh, what your your hierarchy is, but for the hierarchy that I gave you, you remember this. Uh, so the entire database, which consists of a set of uh, tables, which consists of a set of pages, which consists of a set of rows. Um, so, keep in mind, th this isn't a definitive hierarchy. Um, depending on the design of the system, uh, this hierarchy could be different. But using this as an example, uh, if you want to modify a table, then you would then you need to grab an exclusive lock on the table, which forces you to grab an intent to uh, exclude lock on the database. Um, if you want to modify an individual page, then you first need to grab the X here, then you need to grab an IX on the table, uh, and the table, uh, in order to get this IX, you also need to get an IX on the database. Does that answer your question? Yes. And again, uh, that hierarchy is not fixed. Um, okay, one, a couple more examples. Uh, T1 holds, uh, a, uh, holds a shared lock on a row of the table. Uh, what happens when T2 tries to grab an exclusive lock on the table? Fail, but uh, sorry. Right. So T uh, so T one in this sorry uh, T one in this case would have uh, an IS lock on um, on the table. Okay. Uh, last one. Uh, same thing, but T one is modifying row. Pretty much the same thing. Uh, T one holds an IX on the table. Uh, and I guess are not compatible. All right, any questions on this hierarchical locking scheme? Great. So, um, so that's how you acquire the locks. Um, the locks, of course, have to be released bottom up. So you can't release an IX lock um, before you, the, the conditions have to, to hold consistently. If you have an X lock, you need to have an IX on the parent. So you need to release the locks uh, from the lowest levels of the hierarchy first. Um, now, uh, I told you earlier to keep in mind this idea of, um, or this, this question of why, can, why um, shouldn't T1 be allowed to grab an X lock when it's, uh, it already holds an X lock on the parent? Any thoughts? Well, it's not, uh, not so much a deadlock, but um, so T1, if T1 holds an X lock on uh, the parent, what's, what is the, uh, what's a bad, or why is it not necessary for it to grab a, a, an exclusive lock on the child? Right, so essentially you've already, by holding an X lock on the parent, you've essentially excluded uh, any situation where anyone could grab a lock on a child that would conflict with this X. So essentially by holding a, 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 either an X or an S, uh, an exclusive or a shared lock on an object, then there is no situation where someone can grab a child object. Grab a lock on a child object. Oh, uh, 
I'm sorry, I've, uh, there's one thing I've, I've skipped. Um, so there's actually a, a sort of hidden uh, additional mode uh, called SIX, uh, which is shared uh, plus intent to exclude. So this is if, uh, let's say you're reading a, uh, if you're reading a, a database, reading an entire table, uh, but you plan to modify some individual rows of that table. In which case you want to have um, you want to have both a shared block and an intent to exclude. Um, so uh, let's go through a couple of examples of how this actually gets used. So let's say T, uh, transaction T1 wants to scan uh, a relation R and modify several tuples. So what it would do is acquire first one of these shared uh, with intents to exclude blocks on R. That allows it to scan all of the rows of R because it has a shared block on the entire thing. Uh, and when it needs to update an individual row in R, it, it can acquire an exclusive block on the individual tuples as necessary. And that in turn means it needs an IX on the uh, parent, which it has. Um, and if you use the full hierarchy, that also means you need an IX on the individual pages as well. What minimal is that IX? Uh, that's shared. Uh, it's essentially having both shared and intent to exclude. Um, so think of that as a combination of these two columns. So having an SIX would uh, conflict with having another SIX, uh, would conflict with any other transaction that had a, an SIX. It would also conflict with any transaction that wanted to drive a straight block. Okay, uh, another example might be that T2, uh, transaction T2, wants to use an index uh, to read some, but not all of R. So in order to do that, it would first get an intent to share uh, lock on R. And then as it's using the index uh, to scan through the parts of R that it's interested in, uh, it will repeatedly acquire uh, share locks on the, the specific pages that are of interest. Does that make sense? The third example, let's say T3 wants to scan the entirety of the R. Now there are two possibilities here. T3 could grab a shared lock on all of R, um, but it could also behave like transaction two. It could grab an, in an intent to share and then grab a shared lock on every individual page or tuple of the database. Now this brings me to uh, sort of a, a, a more uh, fine grained challenge. So, uh, let's go back to this example where we have transaction one holds an intent to exclude on, um, on the table so that it can modify tuple one. Meanwhile, transaction two wants to do a scan of the entire table. Now, if it tries to acquire a shared lock, it'll fail because shared is not compatible with intent to exclude. On the other hand, we don't necessarily want to stop it from doing any sort of pre-processing. Um, maybe we want to, to allow it to scan through the entire table, uh, scan through as much of the table as possible, uh, and then just wait until, until that last transact, uh, wait until transaction one commits, uh, only when it needs to, to uh, process that last tuple. So an equivalent uh, thing that it could do is grab an intent to share on uh, the entire table. An intent to share is compatible with uh, intent to exclude. And then as it's scanning the database, it grabs shared blocks on the individual tuples. When it gets to this tuple, we'll try and grab a shared block on that tuple, which is incompatible, but at least it will have processed um, a large chunk of the database by that point. This is a little bit more expensive, but you can sort of, you can, sort of um, you can do this hierarchically. So you can first try and grab a shared block on the table if you want to do a scan, and you, then as you're, and then if the, the shared block attempt fails, if, if you're unable to get a shared block on R, 
then you, you try and escalate. You, uh, you grab an intent to share, or you try and grab an intent to share, and if that succeeds, then you try and grab shared blocks in each individual page of the database, and so forth. Does that make sense? Great. Um, okay, so there's one, uh, any, any questions up to this point, by the way? Great. So why, why is it more expensive? Why is this more expressive? Expensive is. Why is it, uh, so it's, uh, why is it more expensive to grab blocks on each individual page? So it's, so it's typically more expensive to grab locks on each individual page, uh, but it's finer grain. So you, you end up with fewer conflicts. So in this case, um, T2 would like to grab a shared lock on the entire page, but it can't because T1 is modifying an individual tuple somewhere in the, somewhere in the database. Um, so if it fails to grab a shared lock on the entire database, It'll try and, and sort of narrow down its scope. It'll, it'll grab an intent to share block on the table, and then it'll try and modify individual tuples in the, in the database. Or sorry, it'll try and, scan, try and grab blocks on individual pages and then tuples if necessary. OK, so one last thing I want to um, talk about is that there's this uh, interesting caveat that comes around uh, due to the semantics of an update. And the main reason that this comes about is that there's this implicit assumption that we're able to lock all of the objects of a database. Now, if you lock an entire table, uh, okay, uh, we'll get to locking an entire table in just a moment. Uh, but first, let me give you a, a small example. So let's say you have two transactions, T1 and T2. T1 comes along and says, um, I want to delete the officer with the highest age of all of the officers in, uh, in the database of rank one. So I'm going to find the officer with the highest age, or rather the age of the highest officer, and then I'm going to uh, delete that particular record. Everyone follow that query? Now let's say, hypothetically, that the, age, the maximum age is 71. Now T2 comes along and says, insert another, uh, another value into officers. And just for the hell of it, I'll make that uh, officer of rank 1, and I'll make them aged 96. Now note, by the way, if, transaction, if this operation had occurred uh, before tra uh, transaction one's operation, this would be the tuple that got deleted. Now transaction two comes along and does something very similar, except now it's going to delete the oldest officer of rank uh, two. And let's say again, for the sake of argument, that that, um, that, that age is eight. Finally, transaction three comes. Uh, transaction one uh, wakes up again, and it tries to figure out what the. It tries to figure out who the oldest officer is of rank two. And note that this has been modified by transaction two. Now, if transaction one had executed as one single operation, then we would have. We would have either. Um, first deleted the officer of age 71, and then gotten, uh, gotten the officer of age 80 in response to this query. Um, or transaction one could have executed second, in which case we would have deleted this tuple, and then gotten the same response as here. So although there's not actually any sort of a conflict between these two operations. None of them modify uh, the same tuple. There's this sort of semantic, I, this uh, semantic idea of the, the greatest tuple, the, the highest uh, ranked uh, officer in a particular uh, in a particular table, uh, that. 
creates a, a sort of a semantic conflict between these two transactions. And so uh, these two operations are essentially inconsistent. And oh well, that's really um, so essentially what's what's happening here is that transaction one assumes that it has locked all sailor records uh, with a rating of one. And now it's entirely possible that we could lock the entire table. Um, it, that also is something that's going to be expensive because it precludes any other um, operation from coming along and modifying uh, any individual. Uh, it comes. It prevents any other operation, any other transactions from modifying that table. So something that we can do instead is add another level of granularity which is uh, this idea of predicate locking. And, well, uh, that's actually all I have for today. Um, I'm going to talk about this uh, next week after the midterm. So since there's a little bit of extra time, uh, are there any questions on the midterm? Project two? No. Yes. Why isn't this consistent? Um, so there's, if we did, uh, so uh, remember there's the, uh, our, our sort of baseline for our operation is this idea of serializability. Um, and serializability starts with this idea of executing uh, transactions in order, uh, in, in entire batches. So if we, had, if we were to execute transaction one in its entirety first, it would get that result. That's the tuple it would delete. But then when it got here, it would, uh, so it's asking for the, old, the age of the oldest officer with rank two. If, if this operation were executed here, it would get the tuple that got deleted by transaction two. Does that make sense? The other possibility is that transaction one executes after transaction two. So if we move this operation down here, then the officer that we delete here is the one that got inserted by uh, transaction two because the age of that officer that got inserted is higher than the age of the officer that got uh, deleted here. And it's the, the inconsistency in this case comes not from a conflict on an individual object. There's no one row uh, that, that these operations conflict on. Um, the, there's, what they conflict on is this sort of more semantic idea of the maximum age in a table. Or more precisely, because a tuple got inserted into the, uh, the this transaction one essentially assumed that the table was static. It modified a. It modified the table. Um, it modified the table, and it sort of assumed uh, if, if it were to lock individual rows, that wouldn't be a, a sufficient way of, of preventing these transactions from conflicting. It could lock the entire table, but that would also prevent these transactions from being interleaved. Um, as it is, they're, they're interleaved incorrectly. They could still be interleaved. Um, so if this operation happened first, then this operation, then this operation, uh, and then this operation. Basically, if we took this operation and we moved it to before that delete, this would be a consistent order, uh, a serialized order. That would be interleaved. So one, 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 one. One operation. Uh, so we, uh, let's call this operation one, uh, transaction one, operation one, transaction one, operation two, uh, transaction two, operation one, operation two. So we do operation one of both transactions, and then we do operation two of both transactions, but we do the operation two in the same order as we do the operation. Uh, so the, the inter they're still interleaving. Um, you, you it's interleaving as long as you don't execute the uh, entire transaction is one batch. So if you execute this first, then this operation, then this operation, and then this operation.